Tonight, we are very honored to have as our guest the Honorable Micah Z. Kellner, who is a New York State Assembly member for the 65th District, which encompasses the Upper East Side, Yorkville, and Roosevelt Island. Uh, Assemblyman Kellner has represented the 65th District since 2007. He sponsored over 40 pieces of legislation, co-sponsored another 220. He serves on five committees, including banks, cities, consumer affairs and protection, environmental conservation, and the Majority Steering Committee. Thanks for being here tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here, Monica. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, we want to get started a little bit about you, who mm -hmm. you are. And uh, probably the, the one question I always ask an elected official is, what led you to seek public office? Um, you know, I had the great opportunity to work both as an activist on the East Side and work for some terrific elected officials like Congresswoman Maloney and uh, the controller Bill Thompson. And so when the opportunity to run um, to succeed Pete Granis, uh, someone who has represented this neighborhood for so many years and has done such a terrific job, uh, people came to me and said, why don't you consider running? And I, I said, you know, why not? Why not? I really love both activism and public service and the chance to make a difference in people's lives every day. Well, you were well known to the community board um, as a hard worker for your um, uh, representatives. So um, we were very happy that you're representing our area up in Albany. Uh, what is your background? Um, I actually, um, I consider myself first and foremost an activist for disabilities rights. I have cerebral palsy myself and I was incredibly lucky. My mother being a physical therapist was able to identify it very quickly and she was able to make sure that I had every service that I needed available to me and so my feeling is I need to make sure that every person with a disability has that and that's really what drives me to make a difference uh, especially since they're a community that, that often is found voiceless. Well, we're going to um, talk a little bit now about some of the pressing issues, mm -hmm. and there are quite a lot that are emerging mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, the biggest one um, uh, that's in the news, there are a lot mm -hmm. in the news, but the budget cuts that we're hearing about in Albany. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more um, about what's the issues and what you, areas you think are going to be cut? Well, I can talk about what actually has been cut, Monica. Um, we went back to Albany for five straight weeks to try to work out uh, a budget deficit plan. The, the governor suggested that the budget deficit was $3.1 billion for the remaining fiscal year. The controller of the state of New York said it was about $4.1 billion. We in the assembly, we predicted it sort of in the middle at about $3.9 billion. That's meaning that revenue was not equaling uh, what uh, we were projecting to spend. Um, sadly, due to the politics of the uh, New York State Senate and how closely divided it was, we could only come to an agreement on making cuts of about $2.8 billion. And they basically affected things across the budget. It was about a 12% cut across the budget, save education. One of the problems is, is that there's a cash flow problem right now in the state. We have bills that we need to pay, and we don't have the money to pay it. And right now, the governor is attempting to do de facto cuts to our school and local municipal aid um, by withholding payments. And there's a question of the constitutionality of that. And there, I know there are certain people who are saying it's unconstitutional because it's a de facto cut without legislative approval. And there are others saying that it's the governor's job and the director of budget's job to manage cash flow. And that he's not actually making a cut, but he is deferring payments. Oh, dear. Um well, do you think they're going to be, um, well, you say across the board, save education. Yeah. Um, well, let's move into um, a little bit more about education and kind of related to housing. Um, the, uh, uh, actually, we're going to move into affordable housing. We're kind of mixing up our yeah. topics here. But uh, uh, there's a situation in the Upper East Side with the Brearley School. Mm -hmm. um, it's a well-known school, nationally recognized. Um, it's acquiring uh, a nearby building with rental apartments. Uh, the building you're speaking of, 85 East End Avenue, is actually two towers. There is a, a Tower A and a Tower B. And currently, um, Tower A, which is in the back, has about 27 apartments that are uh, being filled. It is owned by a company. Um, the the um, Brearley has made its intentions known for a very long time that they want to acquire the building, that they would like the tenants to leave, either by their own accord or through a buyout, um, so that they could then renovate the building and make it part of the school. Um, at latest update, from what I understand uh, from Brearley and their representatives, that they are so far apart on a number with the tenants um, 
I'm sorry, not with the tenants, I apologize, with the owner of the building, that they're really not even in contract negotiations uh, to buy the building at this time. And I believe that is due to um, the state of the real estate market. Mm. Um, you know, the, the tenants have some worries because under the law, a not-for-profit institution can not renew uh, rent-stabilized leases. But the great thing is, as long as these individuals have stabilized leases, they cannot be evicted. So it's not as if Burley can buy the school one day and send eviction notices the next day. All they can do is not, um, not um, renew their current leases. So what we've told tenants who have retained an attorney and are very unified is constantly sign to your leases so that you are protected. I know that Burley has made some offers to the tenants in different ways, but many of the tenants want to stay in the building. And that has been their position, and we are working to make sure that Brilly can see other options, possibly uh, in other locations, because this neighborhood has been so good to them, um, and they've really gotten to flourish. We want them to be a responsible part of the neighborhood. Uh, well, I've heard that there is, it falls under state law, mm -hmm. and some people would like to see that state law modified. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a position on that? Uh, I think it's a tricky situation, because if you cannot, you know, you, you know, you have to be very careful because now we're going to say that not-for-profit and educational institutions, if we're going to limit where they can and cannot buy property, you know, you may do some real damage there. So we have to look at it very carefully, and I think maybe what we need to work towards is a, um, a goal wherein that they can be given a, a similar apartment at a similar price that is also rent-stabilized if, if that's what the tenants want. Mm -hmm. um, now let's move a little bit more into education because um, tight space is the name of the game, the mm -hmm. Upper East Side. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot of uh, meetings with the community board about lack of school mm -hmm. space and they found um, some elementary school space. Do you know if there's any way that uh, in your position in the state government you can help um, our situation in getting opening up more school space? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you've talked about that, Monica. Um, from the moment I started campaigning for this office, I talked about putting together an elementary school task force because in my district and in Community Board 8 for a long time, almost a decade, we had a zone without a school. And that was then creating all those kids were lotteried out to other um, schools. And because those schools also had a population boom, it created for an incredible overcrowding crunch. So we have begun that step. This year, we're happy to say PS 151, the 151 zone school, now actually has a school. We're incubating a new school in Our Lady of Good Counsel on East 91st Street, but that is only going to be there for three years, and we need to find an ultimate home. What I would hope we can do is take back the old PS 66 building, which is currently being used as Richard Green High School. A high school can really go anywhere in the city, and I think there are probably some more appropriate places for that high school to be and we can move that elementary school in there, that creates a 700-seat elementary school. That's, uh, that's a first good step. The second step is at PS 158, we now are going to have some extra space because Eastside Middle School is moving out of the annex. So why not incubate the Meath School for PS 59 in that building so that we actually have, um, have more, uh, we, have, we have another incubating school. We, we've seen what a success PS 151 is already, and a lot of parents are very excited about incubating another elementary school. Uh, another thing that we couldn't do to create more space is we have one of the best G&T gifted and talented programs there is on the Upper East Side is expanding Lower Lab because all these elementary school kids are quickly going to become middle school kids, and we're going to need middle school seats. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at expanding Lower Lab instead of being K through uh, five, maybe K through eight. So it's both an elementary and a middle school. We actually have a lot of great space on the Upper East Side. It's about using it properly. Mm. Um, that begs the next question, mm. which is um, Julia Richmond Educational Complex. Mm. We call it JREC. Mm. Um, it was a huge, crazy mm. issue a few months ago. It's kind of simmered down. Mm. Um, do you know what is going on with that now? Well, as I understand, similar to Brearley, the hunter could not get a sufficient bid on their space down on 23rd Street, that which would needed to have been sold to help pay for the construction of a building at the JREC site. So I think for all intents and purposes, um, that's dead for now. But mm. as the economy heats up, I'm sure that issue will heat up again. But again, that is space we need in the northern part of District 2. Right now we have you know five schools there. 
there is, you know, people have talked about the possibility of adding another school there or maybe rearranging how the space is used there. But that is a vital space that we're going to need uh, for the future going forward because, in fact, we're not seeing less population. We're seeing more of a population boom. Every one of our elementary schools is at 150% of capacity or more, and that's just unacceptable. And then what about the situation with Hunter? They have need for more labs. Mm -hmm. um, is there any talk about how to resolve that, or are they still focused on that site with JREC? You know, we've asked them to look at other opportunities, um, and I think they are. I think they're, they're actually looking at several different things right now and evaluating all their options. Um, there was a very interesting article on your website about the summer reading program. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how that got started? Because that's a really neat initiative for the school children well, in that, summer. Well, that's something that the assembly has spearheaded literally for decades, and every assembly member can choose to participate in it and ask his schools to participate in it or not. And we really thought it would be a great idea. We have a lot of kids. We, we had a tremendous response from neighborhood schools. Um, we made it more than just a certificate, and a, we made it in a whole award ceremony. Every kid, depending on their reading age, got an appropriate book. They got a tote bag, we had cookies and juice, had a chance to take photos with their parents uh, to really celebrate uh, their love of reading. It was really quite terrific. Well, I hope that it's going to happen every year because it certainly is inspirational for kids to meet an assembly member, mm -hmm. I hope. You know, I, you know, I think a lot of kids were really excited. They, they enjoyed getting the book most of all. I, mm -hmm. I'm sure they, they had no idea who I was, but we're definitely going to make it a tradition. Great. Um, let's talk about the environmental issues the Upper East Side, mm -hmm. which... Um, uh, you know, most people say, well, what environmental issues would you have? Your water is pumped in from the upstate and it's pure and you don't have to worry about anything, but there is a lot of stuff going on. Um, and one of those, I think, would uh, is the um, hydraulic fracturing. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can talk a little bit more how how is this um, evolving right now? I mean, it looks like we've got a lot of political support to halt it. Is it enough? Uh, I would hope so. Um, obviously, you know, there is always a bit of a press when it comes to business interests and interests of moving progress forward on, on um, making money and developing different areas and to make sure that we have the right restraints and to make sure that, um, that our environment is taken care of. And we have an interesting issue. There is a large amount of natural gas in the Marcellus Shale. Well, the Marcellus Shale comes up right against the, uh, the, the New York uh, Water Reserve, where we get most of the city's water. And right now, we have a, uh, um, a waiver from the federal government so that we do not have to um, create a, build a filtration plant and filter the water. We have a filtration waiver. A filtration plant could cost us billions upon billions of dollars. And there is a question that because of the way hydro fracking is done and how it's been done in other states, uh, such as Texas, where they've actually, you know, they literally pump chemicals into the ground to try to get to this natural gas, and whether that could pollute our drinking water and really put 8 million people in danger. So we've got to make sure that when we go forward with hydrofacking, that it's not done within the New York City watershed so that, that, that our water is protected. Um. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, air quality issue in, in um, the Upper East Side? Is the uh, state government um, working on monitoring that, with um, especially with I guess global warming? Warming mm. is is having an impact. Well, you know, we 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 are um, we are very much um, interested in um, um, we are very much interested not only in um, yeah, checking our air quality, but also in uh, climate change and global warming. We are part of the we are part of the Reggie program, the regional uh, greenhouse uh, emis um, uh, emissions program, where we have a cap, and people have to pay uh, if they, uh, they they have to pay uh, if they uh, emit um, more greenhouse gases than a certain amount. Um, I couldn't tell you the square uh, tonnage off the top of my head, but you know I know our, my, my predecessor Pete Granis is now the Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner. And I, I've seen several articles uh, about um, how they'd actually do um, spot checks of trucks coming down First Avenue through East Harlem to make sure that they're at the right emissions and they're, they're not emission, emitting more pollution than is legally allowed, and giving those companies and those truckers tickets to make sure that our air quality is good. So it is, it is constantly on our mind, and we uh, have to constantly be wary of it. Um, 
you're involved a lot with environmental issues at, at the, it's mm -hmm. in the committee you're on. And uh, I guess a, one thing that, that keeps coming back, I guess every 10 mm -hmm. years, is, is recycling, which is now starting to come back again. Could you talk a little bit about what are the programs that we're seeing in our area and how do you support them? Well, you know, I think one of the major things that we have to focus on now in, in terms of recycling is um, recycling of, uh, of electronics. A lot of people have a computer and people are getting computers more often, we're getting new cell phones more often, and a lot of these pieces of equipment have dangerous chemicals and people don't know how to get rid of them. And so we need to do a comprehensive recycling program. And I actually sponsor a bill that, that basically says, big box stores that sell electronics, like your Best Buys and your Circuit Cities, either have to accept uh, old electronics back for recycling themselves, they can do it in conjunction with other stores, or if they choose that they don't want to do it on site, they have to pay into a fund so the city can do an electronics recycling program. And I think that would be a great start. We have a, we have a bill in the assembly that I'm a co-sponsor of that also would say the manufacturer of electronics would have to take a certain amount of electronics back. The, the other big issue in terms of recycling, and I'm a, I'm a, you know I'm a big fan of this, is plastic bags. Mm -hmm. We may use a plastic bag at a supermarket once, maybe twice if it's lucky, but it's going to stay in our environment for a thousand years, um, photodegrading, which is going to break down into really nasty chemicals. Uh, it's going to um, uh, be toxic for the environment. So we want to reduce people's uh, plastic bag usage by a lot. So uh, I sponsor a bill in the assembly that would put a tax on plastic bags. It's a small tax, but hopefully it will reduce the usage of plastic bags. In Ireland, they put a similar tax, and within six weeks, plastic bag usage was down 98%. And uh, I know what people say is, well, how am I going to get my groceries home? Well, you can use a reusable bag. And I have actually had over 4,000 reusable bags made up. I give them out in front of grocery stores for free in hopes that people will use them, fold them back up, put them in their pocket, and use them again. And I have one, I have mm -hmm. to say, that's definitely made a difference. Excellent. And it's better than a plastic bag, so I, I thank you for doing that for the community. Um, another uh, topic which is quality of life mm -hmm. is um, the uh, East 91st Street Marine Transfer Station, mm -hmm. which has been in the news a lot. Um, it's got some top support, I think, from the mayor, I believe, but it's, it's difficult for the people in the area. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, the, the mayor decided that he wanted to put a waste transfer station at East 91st Street as part of his solid waste management plan, also known as the Swamp. Um, and the only reason he really picked that site um, was because there had previously been one and it had been grandfathered in. Even though the asphalt green site is completely different. It used to be a commercial light manufacturing neighborhood. Now it is a densely populated residential neighborhood. And it's really quite inappropriate to have something there. The mayor um, has suggested that, you know, that every neighborhood should have to balance its own garbage, not just poor minority neighborhoods. And this has really spoken to um, people's anger, feeling that communities like ours haven't done our fair share. Well, the fact is, we don't send our garbage to minority neighborhoods. In fact, our garbage is merely trucked out of Manhattan. And what we need to do is not truck it up to Manhattan, put it on a barge and barge it to New Jersey, but just continue to drive it to New Jersey uh, through the Lincoln and the Holland Tunnel. Um, emergency preparedness is a very important topic for everybody in Manhattan. And you've been um, working on this. In fact, uh, I believe you were hosting an emergency preparedness event recently. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to us uh, what your involvement is with these programs and what people, individuals can do in the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island? Well, as you know, being a part of the CERT team, Monica, uh, we live on an island. And when you know there is an emergency, people need to be prepared to know what to do to protect themselves, protect their family, and get off the island. The American Red Cross has put together a great program known as Ready New York. Uh, I am a supporter and a sponsor of that program. And we were happy to give them a grant to come to the Upper East Side and train Upper East Siders on what to do in case of an emergency. And everyone got to go away with a go bag, a bag that was prepared to everything you need in case of emergency, water, flashlight, all those items that you're going to need. Um, God forbid we have another catastrophe. We've had catastrophes in the past, and in this city we've always got to be ready. You know, you got to hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. 
Where can people find information about these um, programs? Should the uh, Red Cross or your website? or Well, you can, can go they... to the Red Cross's website or MicahKellner.com is uh, my website, and it's got a host of information, and I know that we have a significant uh, amount of information about Ready New York on there. Because that is important, having a go bag, and as you point out, an island like Manhattan, even more important, uh, the, the people in Roosevelt Island are very, mm -hmm. very attuned to this. Um, now, in uh, economic development for the Upper East Side, mm -hmm. Um, the biggest topic related to that is the Second Avenue subway. Mm -hmm. if, if people who are watching the web mm -hmm. don't get to see Manhattan, if they're they're watching in other parts of the world, which has happened, the Second Avenue subway is being built mm -hmm. and it is being tar tearing up the mm -hmm. Second Avenue area, and a lot of businesses are suffering. Um, is there anything that that you feel that the city, or I'm sorry, the state can do to help? alleviate the, the uh, problems these businesses are having. Well, I think there's, there, there's a lot, and I think we, we, we've seen some of that so far, but, but it hasn't been enough. What I have done is I've crafted a piece of legislation that would give uh, a, um, a, a small property owner a property tax um, rebate if they were prepared to pass that property tax rebate along to their small business owner in terms of a rent reduction. Um, we feel that, you know, the city may lose a little money in the short run in property taxes, but overall they were going to lose a lot more in business taxes and sales taxes if those stores go dark. If those stores go dark, they're not dark for six months or eight months or even a year. We're talking about being dark for seven more years. And it also creates a safety concern in terms of, you know, the best way to have a good street is to have businesses open on that street and people wanting to walk down that street. And so what we're trying to do, we've passed this bill in the assembly. The mayor opposes it. We are hoping that the mayor will realize that this is a good thing. Currently, my staff is doing a study to show just how much businesses have actually lost in the 2nd Avenue subway construction zone. So we can go to the mayor and quantify, this is what you're losing in business taxes. This is what you're losing in sales taxes. Wouldn't you rather pay a little upfront in a property tax rebate so that we can secure these businesses for the future? Well, thank you for doing that. That would be great if it could pass. Um, accessibility is um, a, a concern for a lot of people in New York. Um, there are a lot of people who are dependent on a lot of services in the, in the area. And you've been very active in championing improvement in transportation uh, for everyone who needs help. Um, could you talk a little bit why it's an important issue and what your efforts are towards that? Well, this city is hard to get around if you have two functioning legs. But there are so many of our seniors people with disabilities who have real difficulty getting around this city. And sadly, our subway system is a bit antiquated. Less than 60 out of 460 stations of our subway system are wheelchair accessible. You know, what would normally be a very quick jaunt for you and I on one bus and maybe one subway transfer takes a person who's in a wheelchair several buses and because they have to take a roundabout route based on where they're accessible elevators. Um, I would like to see two things happen. First, I would like to see every taxi in New York City be made wheelchair accessible. Suddenly you'd have 13,000 wheelchair accessible vehicles driving the streets of New York. Very, very easy to find. And secondly, um, right now the MTA has a budget crunch. One of the things they can do to save money, to make a better ride for people who use Accessoride, their paratransit service, um, and to improve service would be issuing debit cards so that people could take black cars, take accessible vehicles. Right now, Accessoride, which people refer to as the five borough tour because it's so bad, it's so bad at getting you to your location, costs us $60 a ride. Now, think about your average taxi cab. Maybe an expensive taxi cab is $25, $30. Imagine the amount of money we would save mm -hmm. if we had a fully accessible taxi fleet and people, the MTA were paying for people to take taxi rides instead of this, um, expensive uh, uh, paratransit service. We're talking about saving $50 million for the city and the state. Well, I think that's uh, something that's needed immediately. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to run uh, low on time, and I'd like to have my last question for you mm -hmm. to talk about what are your goals for the next session of the Assembly? Well, um, you know, I have a lot of goals. One would be to pass a good and balanced budget that hopefully, you know, even in these bad fiscal times, does not hurt um, the most vulnerable and protect our health care system and our children and our education system. I'd like to hopefully pass my bill so we can have a fully accessible wheelchair ta um, uh, taxi fleet. And, um, you know, I'm working on a ho hopefully we can get my 
Second Avenue subway build on, and I have a host of other pieces of legislation that refer to submetering and uh, other issues in terms of how electricity and rent is determined for certain types of tenants to protect those tenants. Oh, really? That, this is the submetering you just yeah. mentioned. Um, that that will help the um, reduce costs for for the, um, the the tenants of New York City. Well, it, it, the key is to make sure that landlords aren't using submetering as a backdoor oh. rent increase. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're getting a subsidy, if their the rent is locked in at a certain amount, suddenly, especially if they have electric heat, you get an electric bill that's four hundred, five hundred, six hundred, a thousand dollars, and you're only getting, you know, maybe a hundred dollars off your rent. That's a de facto rent increase, oh, right. and that's unfair. Um, and uh, just very briefly, uh, we wanted to mention that you uh, introduced legislation called Oreo's Amendment. We're Oreo's almost, Law, yes. Oreo's Law, and very briefly, could you say what that's all about? Well, that is about making sure that rescue groups have access um, to shelters so that we can protect animals and hopefully save more animals' lives. Well, I want to thank you for being here, and I know we cut off a few questions, but um, you're very, very busy in, in Albany, and you do a lot of support for the community board. I want to thank you for that, and I hope you can come back one time uh, for an update on what you're working on. So I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening at Community uh, CB8 Speaks, and uh, we'll be back next month, and uh, have a pleasant evening.